Good evening, I'm Stephen Cummings and uh, welcome again to another edition of the Citizens Community Forum. Our objective is always to have an engaging and interactive as well as a civil discourse uh, and in so doing help develop a culture of peace and understanding and also uh, have uh, the involvement of citizens. And uh, Our topics are also wide ranging. Discussions at times may be emotionally charged but surely we can always uh, find common ground and learn from each other irrespective of our differing views. Uh, this evening inside the Citizens Community Forum we put the spotlight again on education and uh, while many educational institutions around the world have been cautiously easing their way back into the mainstream uh, of learning and teaching it uh, may never be quite the normal uh, having regard to the crippling effects of a pandemic that has lasted almost two years uh, the stark reality is that our global education system has been impacted uh, the pandemic has left millions of students especially in other parts of the developing world on a dangerous risk pendulum of learning uh, deficiency now our topic this evening is reassessing student learning and recovery 19 months into a pandemic and for the next hour and to help discuss the issues joining me is Dr. Paulson Scarrett. Uh, Dr. Scarrett, Dr. Paulson Scarrett has a Bachelor of Education and Primary Education Special Needs from UTT uh, with a Master of Science in Teacher Education, Education of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and a Doctor of Philosophy in uh, in uh, education literacy uh, studies from the University of Tennessee he is a uh, reading specialist on PDX operating committee and a main focus um, in his research uh, agenda is reading education and reading intervention for struggling readers uh, dr. Paulson Scarrett is also a qualified sign language interpreter has uh, and continues to work with the deaf community in Trinidad and Tobago. We have also on the program this evening Dr. Freddie James. Dr. James is uh, the Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education and Lecturer of uh, Educational Leadership at the School of Education, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Uh, she is also a University of uh, Warwick uh, Postgraduate Research uh, Fellowship Scholar and uh, is uh, Vice Chair of the CARICOM team responsible for developing and implementing standards for educators and uh, school leaders. Uh, so there's much more that we can say uh, about uh, both our, of our guests. But uh, let me welcome them to the program this evening. Uh, Dr. Scarrett, um, you were here before, uh, but um, welcome, welcome again to the Citizens Community Forum. Dr. Scarrett? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Cummins. It's good to be here. And thanks for the privilege of being able to share with the community. Indeed. Uh, Dr. James, good evening to you and welcome. Good evening, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much and good evening to your public. No, it's a pleasure uh, to have you both. Uh, well, our topic this evening is uh, reassessing student learning and recovery 19 months into the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Skerritt, I want to start out the discussion with you uh, this evening. Um, looking at uh, the business of uh, university education um, and, and its response to the pandemic, I know we had a discussion um, on the last occasion and um, the objective is really to continue uh, in that vein. Um, I want to start, as I said, with you. Um, we started this discussion as indicated some time ago, um, but you know, when we look at uh, what's been happening in Trinidad and Tobago, and not just Trinidad and Tobago, but the region and the world, um, what has been done or what is being done uh, in, in terms of uh, helping to arrest 
the decline and responding to the crisis or uh, as a response to the crisis in learning and teaching. Basically, um, you know, it's a response to the pandemic, uh, as I said, uh, 19 months on um, in Trinidad and Tobago and by extension, the wider world. Well, I think from a university perspective, one of the things that I know, because we are, have been involved in teacher training, and we have to be training, and both the training we provide for those who will be teaching the primary school system and, and for the different program, um, prepares teachers to become professionals in teaching in the secondary school. And the emphasis now is on really looking at our curriculum and, and doing what we can to make sure that the teachers with training able to, to deal with um, all the things that COVID brought to light, things like the digital divide, um, the, the risks for, for those marginalized, underserved um, students, whether they be students living in rural communities, students living in poor communities, um, students with disabilities, um, and ensuring that we train these teachers to become more flexible and, and, to, and to use some of the the approach is to teaching, like um, enrich accelerated teaching. But when we have to, to address things like school closures and other things that may affect how much students learn, um, teachers are able to, to be flexible and shift to um, provide what students need to both recover and to make the kinds of deals that will, will get them back on track. Mm -hmm. All right, so so that's 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 where we all are. are. Um, uh, Dr. James, um, I want you know to uh, put the same question to you um, from where you sit. I know that um, uh, you uh, uh, you know have been involved and continue to be involved uh, very very deeply uh, in the system of education. Um, what is the response has been you know what has the response been like uh, so far from the university level from your perspective? So the university has a multi-pronged approach to addressing the gaps that the pandemic has churned up and addressing the disruption that the pandemic has caused. From a student perspective, the university has introduced different assessment requirements, different forms of assessments that help students do the work that they have to do and be tested in a way that does not compromise them because of a lack of access or a lack of connectivity and so on. So for example, in terms of assessments, we have assessments being sent out to students and they have a period of time, 24 hours or so, in which to respond, to put their response. So the, this is one area in terms of assisting students. Also, our various units um, across the faculties have mechanisms in place to assist students who may be experiencing well-being issues, who may be experiencing anxiety. And we have at the, at the campus level, the FSU and all these areas that agencies that can address students' needs in that way. In terms of the lecturers and lecturers being prepared when the pandemic hit and schools were closed in March of 2020, the university went on a rigorous professional learning mm. program to scale up, yes. start to be ready and prepared to deliver the curriculum in a different mode and in multi-modes. So those are some of the things that we've done at, at the university level. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and um, campus level. Yes, and uh, we'll be uh, talking more about that uh, a little later on in the program. Uh, this is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Our topic this evening, Reassessing Student Learning and Recovery 19 Months Into a Pandemic. I have with me Dr. Freddie James, a Deputy Dean uh, for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education and lecturer UWI St. Augustine. Also, Dr. Paulson Skerritt, lecturer in the area of reading education in the School of Education, Faculty of Humanities and Education, UWI St. Augustine.
Uh, Dr. James, when we speak of promotion of standards of education, um, what should be the measuring instruments by which uh, we can say, well, this is the best model or this is not the best model, especially in a time when educators have been forced to change the way uh, they would have, you know, done business normally. And, and of course, you know, we are talking about, um, you know, that forced adaptation, uh, as it were, to digitalization and um, the use of ICT. Well, Mr. Cummins, to be honest, there's a sense in which it isn't necessarily forced. Mm. The integration of information technology and technology period into education has been on the books of the, the university and in our preparing of teachers and educators and school leaders, it has been embedded in our various programs. From since 2014, we have been using blended programs, for example, in the School of Education. And we have been preparing teachers and educators and school leaders to integrate technology in their program. So it was, it should not have been something new. Mm. And, and therefore for most teachers, if um, teachers in the classroom who were kind of frontline, if you would like, if we can put it that way, those who had been involved, for example, in a teacher preparation program, such as the Diploma in Education program done at the postgraduate Diploma in Education program done at the School of Education, yes. they should have been prepared. Nevertheless, nobody could have been prepared for mm. what took place in this pandemic and mm. the quick, sh the quick mm. shifts and the quick pivots that people had to make. Leaders, school leaders, for example, had to learn to, to implement adaptive leadership mm. in order to, to ensure that their schools and staff, you know, kept going in, in, in a way that was productive. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of technology in education, the, 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 the points that we are raising in terms of deficiencies and disruption and so really have been articulated and have been in the national and global educational discourse for a number of years. I see. Mm -hmm. if the point is the pandemic made it more imperative to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I use the word forced because, um, you know, there is that view that had it not been for the pandemic, we may have been going about our lives, um, you know, going about you know our merry way and, and not seeing the importance of using the technology uh, dr james well that's what i was saying is it, it should not force it, it what we were forced into or what some people, persons were forced into was to make more use of it mm -hmm. and to hone their skills to be able to use it if they did not have the required skills and and in any kind of change resources and and prepar um, particular preparation for it, scaling up skills and so it's always necessary. Um, when the pandemic hit, it, it, may, it, it sort of separated um, those persons who were more forward thinking, were more innovative. Like at the School oh, of Education, no. we were already delivering the postgraduate diploma in, edu um, in education online we had an online program so so it it was we didn't have to make any huge okay. shifts but then again we were forward thinking right uh, as you as you said um you were a few steps ahead <laughs> all but right that, that is what i'm saying that to yeah. say mr cummins this is where we all should have been we've been trying to integrate technology in the schools for a long time and and it really is an imperative and and it is a way that we have to go because this is the learning for the future this is the best way people learn you know 21st century learning for the future yes so we have to make up our minds and decide are we going to take action or are we not going to take action is it going to be half-heartedly or are we going to really commit wholeheartedly to making the necessary transformations in education that are required Mm -hmm. Having said that, 
Bear in mind that I said nobody, no institution, no organization, no country could have been prepared fully, fully ready, for yes, that or prepared. pandemic and its Understood. impact. I, I, yes. I, I, yeah, I get you, Doctor Doctor James. Uh, Dr. Scarrett, in you know, in really beginning to let's say address the learning and uh, teaching deficient deficiency um, in the recovery process, uh, where do you see us? Um, you know, where is a good point to start, uh, Doctor Scarrett? Because we are at that juncture now where um, the discussion is centered around uh, discovery. Oh, not just discovery, but, um, you know, recovery, so that you would have discovered what would have transpired uh, by way of maybe research or what have you, and now you would have moved to, um, the, the focus would, would be on the recovery process. Well, I think just to comment on two things based on, on your question with Dr. James. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the, the issues that happened before was this lack of flexibility. And you know, you're right, you're right. Uh, in some cases, we the pandemic almost forced people to move away from this rigid approach to doing things. And, and it's okay to consider new, so as, as Dr. James mentioned, we have been preparing teachers, um, talking about technology integration and things like you're still designed for learning. So when you design your curriculum, you think of all the needs of your students and you think of activities that will meet in very diverse ways. You'll engage students. You're going to provide your content in diverse ways. You're going to assess them in diverse ways and not stick to this rigid one way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Somehow, pandemic, things that people were um, working against, suddenly they were more open to, to, to allow for it. And, and, and now they saw, whoa, this is so effective, but we've been saying that all along. So, mm -hmm. that we don't go back into that mode of sleeping and think that mm -hmm. we have to keep that mode of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, Secondly, um, what, there are three things that teachers, educators are concerned about. What, where, is, where are my students now in terms of mastery of the skills? Mm -hmm. um, concepts? What are the interventions that will be most effective for them? And when will that accelerated learning take place? So, um, we have to get caught up and we'll have to either do it in school, uh, we'll have to do it through all our research is showing, tutoring programs, Mm -hmm. Tutoring programs that, that have a high intensity when it comes to tutoring and the tutors are well trained and qualified because somehow a lot of tutoring programs I've found them it's almost a kind of babysitting approach and that can't work. They have to be well trained tutors mm -hmm. and tapping into our retired principals. Um, so many students who have been trained in universities to teach but have not been able to acquire a teaching job, they can be brought into that system, but a very strong tutoring program as well. We have to get in place either um, in school, but perhaps outside of school, before school, after school, on weekends, during the holidays, in order to get students caught up. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what, a good place I think we need to be now. Just as we mm -hmm. do assessment, determine what skills our students have mastered, where they are, what intervention is going to work best, and how we could accel accelerate the learning that has it. Mm -hmm. All right, so that, that's, uh, a, a, from your viewpoint, a good place to start. You know, uh, I have, um, I have, I have uh, some uh, something that I wanted to to share with uh, with with you um, a little later on. But um, um, we just want to also remind our listeners that uh, this is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Our topic uh, this evening: reassessing student learning and recovery. 19 months into a pandemic. I have with me Dr. Freddie James, Deputy Dean. Uh, for graduate studies and research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education and lecturer at UWI St. Augustine, as well as Dr. Paulson Scarrett, a lecturer in the area of reading education in the School of Education Faculty of uh, Humanities uh, and uh, Education, UWI also at uh, St. Augustine. Um, I noticed uh, a very interesting statement made by the World Bank on learning deficiency, and that was way back in 2017. Well, maybe not too too way back, uh, 2017, 2018, and even before the pandemic, the report called for greater measurement, um, action on evidence, um, uh, and it says that, and I'm referring to a, a document here. It says that millions of young students in low and middle-income middle countries face the prospect of lost opportunity and lower wages in the later or latter half of their lives. And because of um, 
the, their primary and secondary schools you know having failed uh, to educate them to succeed in life and uh, this is uh, as I said I'm referencing this report from the from the World Bank um, it warned of a learning crisis um, in global education and in another report I saw referenced the risk of children falling into what is termed learning poverty the report goes on to say uh, schooling without learning was oh, was not just a wasted development opportunity but also a great injustice dr james um, both uh, your responses um, you know to that uh, and and dr scarrett um, but the first um, dr james um, i'm not sure if you would have seen that report but you know it tend to it tend to, to push us into a particular uh, mode a particular direction that that we do have a crisis on our hands dr james yes i i did see the report i i am quite familiar with it and uh, I do agree with it. I mean, who wouldn't if, if you really um, do the facts? We just have to take an example from us here in, in Trinidad and Tobago and when the pandemic hit and to now, have you seen, we have to ask ourselves, what research have we seen that tells us or paints the real picture of what is taking place in schools, in terms of districts, in terms of levels, primary, ECCE, secondary, what is, the, what is the evidence that we have in front of us that we can use? Mm -hmm. Now, that World Bank report was quite significant. And I, I have to say that the World Bank not only made the report and, and stated the facts, but they've put their money where their mouth is, as we say colloquially. Mm -hmm. Because subsequent to that, they have funded programs that are innovative into and and that seek to bring people out of poverty or to prepare train if if you want to use that word and give persons the opportunity so for example they have a social entrepreneurship they funded mm -hmm. a social entrepreneurship to fight poverty program in nepal and um, actually, I'm trying to get that same program implemented here okay. in, in, in Trinidad and, and Tobago. Mm -hmm. But we, we really need to, when we talk about education recovery, mm -hmm. now, in certain contexts, it's a matter of recovering from the many years of disruption of education, mm -hmm. not just what has not happened just the, with the yeah, pandemic. Not just the pandemic. And yeah. at CARICOM, and CARICOM recognizes that. So mm -hmm. when we speak of recovery, in tandem, we are talking about enhancing and we are talking about improving. We are talking about transforming. Because okay. the, some of the issues, as and, and I'm sure Dr. Skerritt um, will be able to tell you about that in terms mm -hmm. of dealing with special needs students, in terms of inclusivity, Yes. in terms of meeting the marginal persons in society, education, meeting them and really um, assisting in alleviating and addressing their needs. Mm -hmm. We have many gaps. And one of the key things the report, um, that report talks about is learning. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference between schooling and learning. And I think for many years, we've been focusing on schooling and not necessarily on learning. Mm -hmm. And, and right. the learning is critical. Mm -hmm. It's not what we, just what we teach is a process that, that takes place between teaching and learning. And there are many factors involved in there. Okay. And the impact of it should be learning for mm -hmm. students. And I mean, I can go into... Okay. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. I know you can. That's and, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, well, we just like to remind our listeners that this is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Uh, our topic this evening: reassessing student learning and recovery. Nineteen months on into the pandemic. Uh, Dr. James, uh, Dr. Scott, we have to take a short break now. And um, when we come back, um, I am going to, uh, Dr. Scott, I'm going to have you also add uh, your perspective uh, to that very same question. Uh, but um, we have to take a short break now and uh, we come right back.
Hello, I'm Stephen Cummings. Join us every Wednesday for the Citizens Community Forum. Where are we now? Your, your assessment. We are in a very dark place. Um, as Mr. Uh, Sir Vivian Eichel wrote in a title of his book, we are in an area of darkness. The structure of the economy between 2009 and 20, 2019, Stephen, landed this economy in the 25 worst performing economies in the world. Even my honest answer is, except for the poorest and most vulnerable, we have to cut it. It's not as if we have a choice. And that's why I'm saying, Stephen, we really need some clear guidance and direction from the government in terms of what's the long-term plan. We know we're in a dark place, but we need you to be able to show us the light and show us, well, okay, we're headed in that direction. We don't want to end up like the Israelites wandering for 40 years in the desert and making no progress whatsoever. And we are streaming live on YouTube, FBN TV, Facebook, and Isaac 98.1 FM every Wednesday, 8 to 9 p.m. Welcome back to the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Uh, we are discussing the business of education uh, this evening. Uh, our topic, uh, reassessing student learning and recovery 19 months uh, into a pandemic. I have with me uh, Dr. Freddie James, uh, Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education and Lecturer, UWI St. Augustine. Also with me, uh, Dr. Paulson Skerritt, a Lecturer in the area of Reading Education in the School of Education, Faculty of Humanities and Education, UWI, also at uh, St. Augustine. Um, Dr. James, uh, Dr. Skerritt, welcome back. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Scarrett, I wanted to uh, have you respond to that uh, question uh, when we went uh, to the break. Um, I know that um, you are also, you know, in the area of special needs, um, special needs, dealing with special needs children, uh, dealing with the deaf. Um, your response uh, to that uh, question before we went to the break. So, um, I agree that the World Bank, you know, they made particular mention to those students who are most at risk in those low and low countries. Um, we have our students who um, the SES is the issue. One of the things that we have to, to look at if we're ever going to address that, what happened with, with COVID-19, um, the consequences of COVID-19 are in no way universal. Okay. Students of um, those who are underserved, those who are marginalized, those students with disability, um, the effect of COVID is multiplied with them because they, before COVID, they were already um, having challenges when it comes to optimal learning. And one of the things that we have to consider is this whole issue of intersectionality. When during the pandemic, one of the things the School of Education did was to highlight the, the matter of intersectionality. That it's never about one thing. It's always about these overlapping identities that students bring to learning. Yes. And we're going to successfully address uh, learning recovery. We have now to use the lens of intersectionality to try to address how all of these things are affecting students. So, so when you talk about maybe a deaf child in the class, a deaf child may have comorbidities and have other disabilities, um, ADHD, autism, they, they're coming from families that, that have very little money. So all of the technologies, the assistive technologies, all of the extra tutoring that can be provided, their parents may not be able to afford it. We're looking at all of these things, and until we um, address the matter of intersectionality, what are all the things that are affecting our, our students, and how can we best address those needs? Um, including poverty, we're going to have the, the issue of learning poverty. Um, in fact, I think there was a, there was a recent um, UN um, formula that I was looking at where they talked about um, learning poverty as being identified with a, with a child who, by age, I think it means age 10, is not able to, to read. read. 
to read, yes. yes. I am reading poverty to inability to read by age 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I know that you know, that's that's your passion, uh, uh, Dr. Scarrett, uh, being you know the area of reading. Um, and uh, have you you know developed that point a little later on? I'm sure uh, in the program. But um, Dr. Scarrett, and um, I wanted to sort of get uh, an idea. As to, I wanted to get an idea as to what was happening in the region as well. And there was a, there was a conference, I think there was a meeting that was held, and um, Dr. James probably would be familiar with this or probably would have heard of it. Uh, Timothy Antoine, general uh, or the governor of the uh, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, had some concerns about the curriculum or curriculum delivery and whether as a region, you know, skills training and skills development were being given their rightful place. And I want us to have a listen to that uh, or part of that conference that was held um, just recently. I think it was somewhere in 2020. So we're going to have a listen to that part of it and then we will come back and continue the discussion. I am deeply concerned about our obsession with subjects rather than skills. Uh, I find it <laughs> difficult to accept that we could go on and on for bragging rights about who gets the most subjects in our schools and not worry about how we connect them with the labor market and what these children are going to do. These students are going bright as they are when they finish school. Because what I see before me is rising unemployment, especially amongst our youth. In many of our countries, the youth unemployment rate is double the national average. So that concerns me, and for me, it is very clear that um, skills is an area. So you can go into some countries and you still can't find plumbers, you still can't find masons. Um, the, the really good ones are in high demand, and the other ones, well, let's just not talk about that. Um, but then you also have the issue of what is it that we're creating for this new economy? When you look at the, 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 the skills required for the 21st century, there, there are skills in the area of emotional intelligence, the soft ones. Then there's coding and there's uh, cognitive reasoning. And those are not skills that are being sufficiently addressed in our school system. And what is bothersome is that not only are we setting up our children for frustration, but when you look at the region, the average spend on education is actually above the average in developing countries. But the issue is really where are we channeling those resources? the quality of the expenditure and therefore I would argue that we need to focus now on what it is that we're going to do. Listen, we have a chance as a region to leapfrog, to make a quantum leap in terms of our development, but it's going to have to be skills. We're going to have to change the dynamic with respect to skills and it starts with a conversation. You can't leave skill development to education and educators. And I say that with due respect, my mom, my dear, was a master teacher principal, I have great respect for educators. But he who knows any only education does not know education. In the same way that he only knows economics does not know economics. You have to have an interdisciplinary approach where you bring others to the table. And a lot of that discussion really requires that we bring industry together. So when Minister Strong was speaking this morning about the need to engage private sector, he kept making that point. I fully agree with him. For, for me to discuss the, 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 the whole evolution of skills in our region at this time, in our school system, you, it has to be a conversation that goes beyond education. It has to involve economists, it has to involve private sector, it has to involve civil society, uh, and ultimately, obviously, it has to involve our youth. So I fully, fully agree that we need to skill. And, and the truth is, more than just teaching or training for 21st century skills, is a mindset, is a mindset that we have to keep skilling and reskilling. Skilling and reskilling, because as Alvin Toffler said, the illiterate in the 21st century is not is a person who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And basically, it requires us to have that agility, as was referred earlier, where we continue to reskill. And so I say to young people, not just that you stay forever young, but you stay forever skilled. And that requires a, a commitment to lifelong learning. Uh, that uh, was um, uh, in ba ba back in uh, 20. 20, and of course, um, uh, Timothy Antoine, Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Uh, Dr. James, um, you care to respond? <laughs> it's, it's very interesting that um, you brought up that particular um, video mm -hmm. and with his, his comments. I say this because um, I agree with most of what he has said. Mm -hmm. 
Well, no, he's um, very he's very outspoken, huh? so he would have, um, I suppose. Um, but but I, I would allow you to develop your your point. Yes. Yeah. No, I agree with most of what he said. And some years ago, it was twenty seventeen. I uh, and another colleague of mine from the School of Ed, we began to look at at how we can impact, have more impact in terms of our teaching and how impact in terms of the learning of the students. And we forged a project with Finland, with some Finnish co colleagues, that does exactly what he's talking about. So I was smiling throughout the whole thing because mm. it is really adopting, it is education and it can be situated within the domain of education. It is, um, we adopt a design-based approach a design-based pedagogical human development approach to education, which really is to have um, um, students or participants focused on solving problems, real problems. Yes. And, and that's, that's the way. So you learn different skills to solve real problems and it's entrepreneurial and it's innovative as well. But it, it is something that is situated in education. And in 2020, just before that pandemic hit in January, we had a team come from Finland and they did some um, training with our faculties, across the faculties at the, the campus, the St. Augustine campus, in that, that mode of learning, in that approach. Because it's pedagogy at the end of the day. Yes, indeed. Um, and um, so he's right. Um, I'm saying that it is, but it is education. It's not like if it's it's a difference between doing different skills and all 21st century learners need to have these skills. Mm -hmm. So it's not just to use skills, uh, you know, uh, as if it's a separate thing. It's something, it's an approach, a pedagogical approach to learning that is human, you know, based on human development, it's based on innovation, entrepreneurship, and mm -hmm. real world solving real world problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Scarrett, I know your, your specialty is, uh, well, you know, you, you focus a lot on reading and reading development and um, special needs, but where skills are concerned, skills development are concerned, uh, Dr. Scarrett, um, of course, you know, special needs uh, children uh, do have a place as well, Dr. Scarrett. This is the video I was recalling a recent conversation. We had a, a lot of staff, departmental meetings. Um, so the, the group responsible for STEM, STEAM, STREAM, mm -hmm. um, you know, they were presenting the report and, and, and some of the work they've been doing. And, you know, we're talking about a mindset, still not understanding why we need to be taking a look at, at that approach to, to education, where, as, as Dr. James said, that whole problem solving um, so there's a connection to real world application. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go from a tangent because you asked me, you know, to look at this in relation to students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, um, we want to also include not just the focus on skills, but also SES, social emotional learning, especially with the pandemic. So many of our students have had all kinds of experiences. I'm worried about the students coming back to school. Mm -hmm. um, we now need to have that focus and skills so that um, students can be prepared to, to deal with, with what some of the things that the pandemic brought yes. on us. Yeah. Um, we were trying to find a plumber. I, had, I was trying to find an electrician to do something. And I, I'm, I'm surprised how difficult it is to find a qualified electrician. Mm -hmm. And if you want to charge you, um, you know, so much money to get a simple job done, yes. um, if, we are, if we are more qualified, trained um, um, to I would have to struggle that, that much. Mm. <laughs> Indeed. The point of is something that we need to be spending a lot more time also um, addressing. In addition to the skills, making sure students that their cognitive development, they become problem solve, they able to think critically and apply things to real world mm. living, especially as we're facing climate change and, and, and climate adaptation and building resilient communities. Our, our young people need to be making contributions to resilient communities to deal with the realities of climate change. Mm -hmm. But um, the impact of lost instructional time, 
requires that the students um, somehow their their SEN needs to be foundational for them to be able to to, to make that that leap. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. understood, understood. Yes, indeed. They have been impacted um, even more so that um, that is to be addressed with them. Mm-hmm. Dr. James, I've heard the, the comment that um, we are, even at the university level, we are training engineers to be engineers, but not to be problem solvers. Um, yes, um, you know, you are involved in, in a formal uh, you know, period or level of, of education, but um, the focus is not on um, problem solving. How do you respond to such a, a, a statement or such a view, Dr. James? Well, I beg to differ, um, particularly because in that I, I know for a fact in, in the Faculty of Engineering they have projects that students um, do, and across the university, we have moved away from that kind of of teaching where it's it's just um, theoretical to it being more practical and being more adaptive to real world issues. Inva- yeah, environment, yes. so I really have to say that at, at you know even in the faculty of humanities and education for example it, we have um in our cultural programs they they um have parts of it components of it and that allows for solving real problems doing projects that can solve real problems. The the area of need that we may have is resources for these students to bring these projects to start up, for example. You know, to have some sort of funding, some sort of seed funding or something, so that these projects can be brought to start up. Yes. Um, and we're working on that. And in terms of that project I told you about, we it's, it's something that we're working on. But certainly um, at the university, they, and in engineering, I'm mm-hmm. certain, because the dean of, um, of that, that particular faculty was one of the persons who went us with Finland to Finland to, to have a better look at that approach, that design-based approach. And it's because of the projects that they did mm-hmm. to see where can they go from there. So across the university, I can tell you that this kind of thing is happening. All right. Maybe we need f- funding to, to, to make it more <laughs> impactful. Yes. No, and this is not a plea for funding I'm making here, <laughs> but I'm just saying to, to bring them from paper, in other words, mm-hmm. and bring them to start up because they can become, some can become real businesses. You know? Indeed, indeed. Well, you know, Dr. James, I, I, there, will, there will always be the need for funding. Um, this has been a call I know for and continues <laughs> it's been a call over over the many decades <laughs> this business of you know the need for more funding but you know that's probably uh, you know a t- topic for another another session another discussion and uh, we'd also like to remind our listeners that this is the citizens community forum I'm Stephen Cummings our topic this evening reassessing student learning and recovery 19 months into a pandemic and I have with me Dr. Freddie James, a Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education and Lecturer, UWI uh, St. Augustine. Also Dr. Paulson Scarrett, Lecturer in the area of Reading Education in the School of Education as well, Faculty of uh, Humanities and Education, UWI also St. Augustine. Uh, Dr. Scarrett, I wanted to have you develop that point um, that you, you touched on a little earlier on. Um, in dealing with trauma and difficult students, um, do we have sufficient resources, uh, you, you believe, um, as a region um, to effectively respond to the crisis? I also want you to address the issue of uh, special needs children in this regard. Well, what I know we need to do, whether we have resources or not, uh, we need to st- start making sure that schools are a safe place. When we had schools um, in 2016, I was interestingly surprised um, that a lack, a lack of safe environment there was a relationship between that and reading achievement. When they looked at the data and how students performed in the schools across Rio and Tobago, one of the factors that had a relationship between um, low achieving students in reading 
was unsafe school. And a lot of students are coming back from all this trauma that they've experienced in a number of ways. Um, reports about increasing child abuse and so many things that happened during the pandemic. Uh, we need to be ensuring we have safe, positive, stable environments for schools, mm -hmm. uh, building a closer relationship between schools, students, families, educators, and taking the time to explicitly teach um, those social emotional learning skills um, that is explicitly taught and also built into the activities that, that we teach in our lessons. So it's not just direct instructions, identifying the skills of problem solving, of um, being able to manage crisis, manage um, relationship issues, but also in our activities, having students, while we're teaching the content, building very creatively, designing activities where students will be able to manage those things, practice those skills while developing. So I think those those are things that need that needs to be done. It has to be all meaningful because when we look at problems, if we're gonna solve them, we, we could have all of the education as as, as the gentleman said, um, you know, all, if all you know about education, you're not truly educated. So we can have all of the education, uh, we have people with a lot of PhDs, we still need to have some basic wicked problems. And yeah, and still can't find a plumber or a qualified electrician. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, Dr. Dr. Scarrett. Uh, Dr. James, uh, some coping, you know, recommendations for teachers. Um, you know, what would you advise, uh, you know, or, you know, advise? Because there is a recognition that we also have struggling teachers as, as we do students. Um, what can be some coping strategies, uh, especially, you know, during uh, such a time as, as, as we have with the pandemic? Well, I like to, to um, say the three C's, mm. connect, communicate, collaborate. Teachers need, we need to, we all need to connect because we are teachers as well. And that connection, making the connection with others, forming communities of practices, or forming um, learning communities, professional learning communities, just being connected in that way professionally, I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Communicating with colleagues, communicating with your lead, school leaders, communicating with your middle management teams, mm -hmm. and collaboration, collaborating within your school, across the schools. And this speaks to the lead. It's not just um, teachers who are struggling. Eh? You have leaders who are struggling mm -hmm. as well. And, and these three C's apply to them as well. Connect, communicate, collaborate. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm, I'm sure that the teachers uh, who are listening to us um, would appreciate... And I should say, sorry, sorry, Mr. Cummins, but I should say, I'm not just only talking about connecting, collaborating and communicating in a homogenous way with teachers only yeah, but, or with educators only in your school or so, but across um, disciplines. It's a, it, we, we really have to take a multi-pronged, multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral approach to really recover. Mm -hmm. And I mean, CARICOM has put out a document. We have a document out on, on um, education recovery that speaks to that multi-pronged approach but it has to be multidiscipline it has to be multi-sectoral mm -hmm. you, you, you know that that sort of homogenous grouping alone will not get us because it's just not one way of thinking that will get us through this pandemic or get us through any kind of emergency in education and for education all right. Uh, Dr. James, I want to stay with you um, for a while still. Um, are there any um, university studies or data statistics that can tell us um, exactly what has happened over the last 19 months um, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, and maybe by extension the region? Because when we talk about the University of West Indies, um, it's really a regional institution. Well, yes. I mean, um there is a there is a study out of Barbados for uh, um, a couple of colleagues who who have reported on the impact of the COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. And it may and not necessarily be just Trinidad and there. Tobago, huh? but as I said, it may not necessarily be just Trinidad and Tobago. But uh, yeah, this one came out of Barbados. Mm -hmm. 
we also have a study that came out from the school of um from colleagues of the school of education as well on on um what took place what were the measures that were put in place when the pandemic hit you have studies um you have studies coming out of jamaica as well in terms of the impact of COVID-19 in, in different areas in well-being, on well-being, educators' well-being, and also in terms of learning. So there, there are studies that are coming out. Um, I myself have been involved in a study that is, is, has gone to publication that, that, that looks at um, the impact you know, across the region of um, the COVID-19 in, in terms of teachers' preparedness for, for um, remote learning and for reopening of schools. So there are studies that are being done. The thing about it, Mr. Cummins, let's be honest, how many people really sit and read those studies or mm. even, I mean, a lot of things are coming in different forms. A lot yeah. of the, the data, a lot of the research is coming in video forms and so on. And we need to really tap into that. Look at what the research is saying before, you know, we make decisions or, or we make policy. And that, that's why I was saying, you know, we, we have to look at whether in our own society, how has research been articulated on this pandemic coming from the Ministry of Education in particular, in terms of districts? Do we know what is happening in a particular district? Yes. In, in terms of over, you know, it's 19 months. Mm -hmm. uh, how many? And and we talk about access to devices, but we have to go deeper than just students having devices. What use and what value is coming to their learning mm -hmm. from having this device and from interacting with this device? Right, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Scarrett, from a uh, special needs, uh, you know, and uh, the reading. Uh, policy viewpoint and I, I I remember you and I had a discussion bef uh, before um, I, and you had some concerns about um, a reading policy and, and, and I know um, that was a long discussion that, that we had but you know in response to what um, Dr. James has said um, I want to get your perspective in uh, on this as well. Uh, I want to just go back really quick to the matter of support for teachers um, I think uh, in the ministry, one of the things you need to look at is really building up a system of substitute teachers. Teachers need, need that support. That's one thing. They also need to have packaged um, that evidence-based uh, evidence -based toolkit where, where teachers can, can really have a, something to go to so they can find out what's working. Remember, the fact that something is evidence-based doesn't mean it works for everybody. So, the students can be different, and, and so strategy especially tailored for students now, may work very well as evidence supported. But for whom? Um, so if you can have a, a like a kind of evidence-based instructional toolkit that teachers can, can can really go to this if you like to trust, I can bring this to my classroom. Um, so I think and then as I tied to what Dr. James said, and that professional learning community, but it needs to be very flexible. It needs to be to, to, to allow teachers to be able to access this using some of the new digital technology available so that you don't just pull teachers away and they become burdened by going to another day of professional development. Yes. But, but have access to it when, when they are able best to, to do so and keep their learning. Um, I like that. Keep learning. That's what we need to do. Again, I'm reading that comment that, that was made earlier. Right. As we know, um, that's been in our minds. In fact, not right now we're trying to, to get a reading clinic because while our, our pedic that we've talked about on this program before takes a look at assessing students' um, needs and, and trying to develop interventions for them, we feel that a big um, contribution to learning recovery has to be addressing the reading of students. Right. And while Dr. Davis want to make a piece of funding, I know that the reason <laughs> is nothing to talk about money because. Um, addressing the needs, getting that tutoring system for students is important. And that means the need for qualified tutors, a space for them to work with, and that require, requires funding. And that's one of the things in our mind now to get a reading clinic set up at the university where we can bring the best of evidence-based instructional strategies to address the literacy um, crisis that we see. All right. All right. 
And uh, this is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Our topic this evening, reassessing student learning and recovery 19 months into a pandemic. I have with me uh, Dr. Freddie James, Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education and a lecturer at UWI St. Augustine. Also, Dr. Paulson Skerritt uh, in the area of reading, education in the School of Education, Faculty of Humanities and Education, UWI also at St. Augustine. Uh, Dr. James and Dr. Scott, we are almost uh, out of time on uh, our program uh, this evening. And uh, in the closing moments, I just wanted to have uh, to get some closing remarks um, from, uh, from you both uh, on where we are at this time, where we should be going, and uh, some, uh, maybe some closing recommendations as to what we can probably um, have uh, in terms of implementation, immediate implementation, to uh, take us out from where we have been uh, over the so many months. And we're talking about um, students specifically, and by extension, teachers. Um, your closing remarks, uh, Dr. James. Okay, I would like to draw persons' attention to the Learning Recovery and Improvement Program that CARICOM has developed. It's a nine, it has nine components, leadership and accountability, management and communication, regional and national partnerships, teacher support and collaboration, formative assessment, inclusion, SPED, well-being, resources and curriculum, parents and family, and lastly, community and community organizations. I think uh, it's on the website. I think it's a very important roadmap to recovery and improvement the components and and that's just what it is it's it's a, a model that can be adapted it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all um but it would be useful and coupled with that i think we really need in trinidad and tobago to develop the parallel informal education system informal education system. I think we need to develop that parallel system because that is a system that can reach people, reach students, reach parents, reach teachers in emergency, when we're in emergency, an emergency state. It could be a pandemic or anything else. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Dr. Scarrett, you have the last words. <laughs> um, Earlier, I mentioned this whole matter of intersectionality, something I feel strongly about because I think students are coming with it. There's so many things impacting um, their issues. And, and unless we, if we become polarized and think it's just one thing, um, we won't get it. We, we have to identify all of those uh, multiple identities, multiple um, adversities, multiple um, marginalizing circumstances, and, and, and try our best. Address it. Some people might say that's very idealistic. We can't achieve that. Mm. But whatever lens we take, it has to look at our oils. We end up not succeeding. Mm -hmm. All right. So I take it that that's, um, those are your closing words and uh, closing remarks, uh, Dr. Scarrett. Uh, Dr. Scarrett and uh, Dr. James, uh, I want to thank you both for taking the time to sit with me uh, inside the Citizens Community Forum this evening. It has been a pleasure, and I suspect that um, there were areas that we did not go into that we would probably take the, the time and the opportunity to do uh, do so at another, um, another occasion. But again, um, thank you for both for uh, taking the time to be with us uh, inside the Citizens Community Forum. Thank you for having me. Dr. James there, uh, Freddie James, uh, Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education and Lecturer at UWI at St. Augustine. Also, uh, Dr. Paulson Scarrett, uh, Lecturer in the area of Reading Education, also in the School of Education, Faculty of Humanities and Education, UWI St. Augustine, talking with us there on the Citizens Community Forum and our topic this evening reassessing student learning and recovery 19 months on into a pandemic i'm stephen cummings so i'll see you next wednesday when we have another program see you then it was a famous poet who once said they came for the jews and i did not speak out because i was not a jew then they came for the communists and i did not speak out because i was not a communist and then they came for me, 
and there was no one left to speak for me. Words there from famous poet Martin Nimelor, 1892 to 1984.